Hello. Welcome to Converging Dialogues. This is Xavier Bonilla. On this episode, I'm very happy to bring the conversation I had with Barack Kardashian. Uh, Barack is Associate Professor of Strategy and Policy at the United States Naval War College in Rhode Island. He has a PhD in Political Science from the University of Chicago. He has taught in England and Spain um, and now is here in the U.S. So he's, he's actually taught all over the world, which is super awesome. Uh, much of his main interests are in territories, international security, and state formation. And he is the author of the fabulous book, Shifting Grounds, The Social Origins of Territorial Conflict, which is what we talk about in this conversation. We talk about territory, nation states, how we define them, what are the contours, the boundaries of these, how they came into uh, kind of origin, how we've been thinking about them historically. We talk about empire, healthy nationalism, different ethnic groups within certain places and certain territories. We also talk about how we define borders, talk about Westphalia, mosaic and monolithic order, the Ottoman Empire, war and conflict, the current Russian and Ukraine conflict, and many more topics. I absolutely loved his book. Um, I Having all these conversations with um, historians and doing a lot of, you know, research of my own on history and geopolitics and looking at current events and things like that, you, you start to have a lot of questions, you know, like there's one country or one place, but how did all these ethnic groups get there? What happened when this used to be a territory where this was a part of an empire? So his book is just fabulous at kind of, um, kind of marching the reader through, uh, you know, how these things kind of come to be, uh, kind of, in the abstract, generally, and then gives plenty of examples throughout the book. So it's 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 just an absolutely fabulous book. He's also super 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 nice. Um, he was such a delight to talk to talk with, and he's doing such great great work. So it was uh, it was really really a lot of fun for me to to talk with him about these issues. Um, as always, you can find this conversation, all other conversations at convergingdialogues.substack.com. I'm also on YouTube, so get over there, like, subscribe, follow, uh, tell your friends, share with them, contribute. All of that is much appreciated. And now I bring you Barack Kadach. I am here with Barack Kadachin. Uh, Barack, uh, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. I am very much looking forward to speaking with you. Thank you so much for the invitation. And it's a pleasure to be here in this virtual space. So once again, really appreciate the invitation. Yeah, 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 totally, totally. Uh, so you've written a, a very wonderful book uh, that is, is uh, fortunately or unfortunately, I'm not sure, uh, just evergreen for the things going on in the world. Uh, and I think it's a it's a good thing to consider anyways. Um, the book is called Shifting Grounds, The Social Origins of Territorial Conflict. Uh, this is out through Oxford. Uh, so we'll talk all about it, all the major themes from it. Uh, before we do, uh, just kind of give listeners a snapshot of who you are professionally, academically, and uh, what you what you're currently up to. Sure. I mean, uh, born and raised in Istanbul, Turkey. Uh, I just came to the United States for a PhD some 20 plus years ago, got a PhD in political science from the University of Chicago. I taught in Spain, Britain, then came back to the United States almost like 10 years ago to the U.S. Naval War College, where I happen to be an associate professor of strategy and policy. My specialty is in international relations, global history, and more recently, the last maybe decade in political geography. Mm. Yeah, that's that's uh, that's wonderful. You, it's that's really cool that you've taught in different places and been different places. Um, that has to be moving is moving is challenging, but <laughs> yeah, moving sucks. But it's cool. It's cool to, to to teach things, especially if you're talking about international kinds of topics. To actually do it in other places, not just you know stay in one place and do it kind of from afar, from a distance. So that's really cool. So with the book, um, I guess what would you say is the main thesis or the big thrust of the book that you're trying to uh, illuminate. It's, you know, thankfully, and, and for in my opinion, uh, wonderfully detailed, which I, I like. I like books that are detailed. Um, so, but what what is the, kind of give us the 30,000 foot view of understanding territories and states and societies. Um, yeah. What's the, what's the main premise here? The starting point is territory or territoriality. These concepts lie at the heart of 
what I study, what most of my academic kin study, international relations scholars, territory lies at the heart of state system, lies at the heart of international politics. But in so many ways, uh, in my discipline, international relations, territory is not always very well defined. But still, I mean, there are multiple scholars who make the following point. The territory, as we understand the term, is not a thing. It's a social and political construct. So in so many ways, territory or territories are what states and societies make of them. How we think about the association between space and society is basically an idea. And it, these ideas differ from time to time, from place to place. So building on this background, I tried to follow a certain premise that's, that already exists in political geography. So it's basically, you know, it's, it's not a new thing for political geographers. Territories are what states and societies make of them. But given my background, I study organized violence, I study international security, I study strategy and war, or teach strategy and war. Uh, I tried to push that argument so that if it is the case that territories are what states and societies make of them, if territories are mostly social and political constructs, that only means one thing, that these ideas, dominant ideas about state, society, space relationship, they have to, and they did, and they do, differ from time to time, place to place. Then the next conclusion comes, if that is the case, considering that states no matter how we define states, have typically fought over territory. It must mean that. Mm. If territory is a political construct that changes you know, from time to time, from place to place, then those states or state-like entities perhaps did not always fight over the same thing. Mm. If territory is an idea you know, and if it changes from time to time, place to place, and if territory, war over territory, organized violence over territory is more or less a constant in human history, then it can't be the same that all these states and state-like entities of human groups fought over the very same thing. Mm. Then following this insight, I try to look into the ways in which how we can categorize different territorial models and aspirational models and coming up with a two-by-two two table separating different, separating between different models of territorial you know, constructs. I try to trace the link between roughly four main territorial models hmm. and patterns in war or organized violence over territory. Hmm. And I did not stop there. I, in fact, did not think I was going to go that far. But when I was writing the book, I realized, well, it's not the case that different territorial ideas may lead to different patterns, different strategies in terms of organized violence. But organized violence and war, broadly speaking, can also affect and transform those territorial ideas. So I also went for the other side of the equation. Mm. So it's not like different ideas affect different patterns in organized violence. But at the same time, war or organized violence can affect and can help transform, maybe force evolve certain territorial ideas in certain time periods and geographies. Mm. And look, building on that, uh, I specifically focus on multiple cases, examples, as you might put it, that range from, say, early modern Europe to you know, all the way to ISIS, from the Ottoman Empire, uh, early modern empire to British colonialism in South Asia, from the French Revolution to World War I to Peace of Habsburg in 1555. So I try to trace these in mm. as many different places and time periods that I can. And basically, all these suggest I might have a point that different ideas, territorial ideas affect different patterns in war. And wars, especially great power wars, may transform, help transform territorial ideas over time. But the main trust of this book was this concept of the territorial trap. Simply put, that we look at our current dominant territorial assumptions. They may not apply to many countries or not, but we internalize them. And then we apply those assumptions, those blindfolds, when we're looking into the past. Mm. So we see the past, we see the past with the territorial lenses of the present. So in so many ways, the, the trust of the book is trying to highlight that. So if we assume that there are multiple lenses, multiple ways to think about territory, we should break out of this 
you know, concept of the territorial trap, which forces us to employ only one set of lenses and maybe maybe try to wear different kinds of lenses and try to look at the past from different eyes. Mm, mm, yes, nicely said. I, I have so many questions. Okay, Please. so so <clears throat> I guess the first thing here, uh, we can maybe go into your kind of two by two you know, uh, plot that you have there. But um, when people, so I think if, if, if listeners are, are listening to this and they're saying, okay, when I look at a globe and I look at a, or I look at a map, I see a bunch of lines drawn around a certain area, right? There's the United Kingdom, there's Turkey, there's Germany, there's, you know, Russia, there's, you know, so on and so forth, the United States, Mexico. But then there are other places that are less uh, obvious. So one uh, uh, a, a place that you could say is, well, you know, the Kurds don't have lines on a map, but they're in four other places, at least, that are, um, you know, they have like a territory, if you will, or a portion of uh, Iraq, of, of uh, Turkey, of uh, uh, Iran, right? Um, they, they're in, so they have all of those things are kind of sectioned off for them. Uh, you could look at uh, the Northern Caucasus region, right? And there are all of these ethnic groups that are there. And so, you know, they have been given a territory by what's there. So people look at nations uh, and or, as you will say, a nation state, but then they'll say this is a kind of wider territory. So in terms of how we're both, so two, two points, how do we look at these terms, uh, a nation, uh, a nation state or a state uh, um, and a territory how do we define these terms conceptually and how do we define these terms actually right so when i think of you know a uh, the uh, you know guam is a us territory puerto rico is a us territory but it's not you know i mean it is also a kind of a country and an island all these things so they, there's all these kind of splits that happen how do we navigate this space to say here's what is important for how the world is now and of course we'll spend time going backwards of looking how that's evolved over time but how do we navigate that i think our present day understanding and this has been i think this way these for maybe six to seven years our present day understanding of international system what states what nations what nation states are if you look from a macro historical historical perspective, these are rather new. So if you can jump into a time machine mm -hmm. and go maybe 200 years back, and we talk about these in Turkey, we talk about this country, that country, you know, if you could communicate with the locals like 200 years ago, it would be difficult for us to explain what these things are. Because, yeah. because nationalism, in the sense we understand it today, in the nation state form is rather new. And in fact, the prevalence of the nation state form on a, global, on a global scale, is in fact much newer. So mm -hmm. if you just jump into a time machine and go back, not that much, but only 100 years, a good chunk of the world was run by, you know, run through colonialism or quasi-colonialism. And even, even leading into the Second World War, or even after World War II, there were, multi, there were a good chunk of territories in the world that we now call nation states, but were not deemed as nation states back in the day. So as a first cut, I think this nation state model, which I argue that lies at the heart of the territorial trap, sort of puts us in a certain conceptual and analytical lenses, blindfolds maybe. So we, we think about the present and the past in a certain way. But I think, but I think your examples about Guam and Puerto Rico are right on the spot because they, you know, examples like that are exceptions that prove the rule. So in many parts of the world, I mean, even though they may appear, they may not appear like a robust nation state, there are many states that, you know, United Nations take to be a nation state. So the nation state model, from the way we're socialized, from the way, you know, we think about the world, because we think about, as I described, these sharp lines, and in political maps, all different countries are usually 
designated with different colors. And the color inside those borders are usually singular, right? So it's not like we have France. For France, if France is yellow, it's yellow. It's not like you have shades of yellow within France and Portugal. That's how we think about the world, the map. Then when it comes to, say, present-day politics, what sort of appears as an anomaly is, in fact, an inbuilt feature of the system. For example, I think the Kurds is a good example. So the Kurds, a diff- apart from Syria, and even in Syria, it's not like it's a de facto you know, control. It's not like a real international mass control. Mm-hmm. Kurds, uh, as a broader population, can be thought as the victims of this nation-state model and its territorial underpinnings. Mm-hmm. So, and if you jump into a time machine, if you go to, say, oh, roughly 100 and plus years ago, say, World War I, there's rampant colonialism, and World War I ends, the Ottoman Empire is going down the tubes, and the British and the French come up with this secret and not-so-secret not agreement, sykes Pico agreement, and they decide to literally carve up territories. In mm-hmm. So if you look at maps in, in Africa, also maps in the Middle East, many maps look like as if someone just sat on a table, maybe got a cool be- a cold beer, a map, a ruler, and a pencil. And in, in a way, this is exaggeration, but that's, mm-hmm. that's mm-hmm. more or less how most of the borders were drawn. At least this happens, that happens, and eventually we end up with multiple nation states over time with their strict borders emerging. Turkey is one of them. Turkey is an exception, with one of the exceptions that did not have to go through colonization directly. Mm-hmm. But you know, some of the Kurds uh, end up inside the Turkish nation state. Mm-hmm. Right. The Turkish nation state, founded in 1923, that, you know, tries to homogenize the social spatial dynamics within the borders. Even though you know, in 1923, it probably didn't look like a very homogeneous social spatial group. But they try to make it so right? through assimilation, through mm-hmm. indoctrination, through education. And on the other hand, in Iran, you also have in the west side of the country a Kurdish population. But the Iran, Iranian state has been more or less out there for a long time. Iran has to go through a period of semi colonization, maybe direct colonization, Soviets, and then the, Brit- the British and the Soviets, and vice versa. But in the end, the Kurds in Iran also did not end up with their own nation state. They are accepted to be this group, this minority group within the broader Iranian nation state. And Iraq and Syria, which used to be parts of the Ottoman Empire until the end of World War I, they end up with their own nation state or as an ideal nation state. And Kurds in both countries eventually got locked as part of that greater nation state. Hmm. So, so if, if you think about the United Nations, if you think about the nation state form, once again, the Kurds as a broader group can be seen as one of the most visible victims of this nation state form and its untitled underpinnings, because eventually they could not form, for whatever reason, a unified Kurdish nation state in the territories they can be counted as majority. Instead, they were first separated, divided, uh, among four aspiring nation states, and eventually that sort of more or less locked them inside those nation states with little, uh, say, chance to form their own nation state. And that recently we're seeing more and more, say, uh, diversions from this model, but the greater model is still there. So when the Kurds, for example, in northern Iraq, they want to, they want more independence from the central government in Baghdad, they are not aspiring for a new territorial model. They just want their own nation state, mm-hmm. which the surrounding countries don't want to have. But the nation state model is so you know, hegemonic in that sense, so dominant. Even minority groups that want more autonomy, they also want their own nation state. So it's basically a zero-sum game since these four nation states, especially, say, Turkey, defines its own national identity through inviolable borders, a discrete territorial unit. So if if the Kurds want their own state or autonomy within Turkey, that feels like, for many Turks, is an assault on their national identity. So indivisibility of the national territorial borders become a very, very 
important element. So how can we understand nationalism? I can go on forever, but I think it's difficult to understand the territorial underpinnings and consequences of nation-state model by looking only at nation-state. So one thing I also tried to do was to, okay, let's look at other time periods, other geographies. You know, when those when these ideas were not dominant or maybe did not even exist at all. So in those times, different kinds of conflicts would occur in present time. Most of the conflicts, territorial conflicts, more or less revolve around the idea of nation states. All nations should have their own independent territorial unit. But in the end, some of those groups are trapped inside other greater nation states. So first come advantage. So this is more or less how, you know, I think we can approach the issue. But that doesn't change the fact that the master model, even today, remains to be the nation state form in terms of how we think about the map. So we don't think about the map like at France, yellow, but different shades of yellow, maybe some white areas, some blue areas. France is all yellow. Yeah. Germany is all blue. Mm-hmm. Turkey is all green. So this and that. So once you think about, you know, there's the notion that Turkey is all green, France is all yellow, Germany is all blue. There's a social special interpretation of this. So it means that the people living inside those territories are in some level are social spatially homogeneous. But in reality, it is not the case in many you know, countries, many examples we can count. So I think that is one answer that I can give, but I'm not sure if it spoke to your question. No, 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 no. It's great. I, I have, I have more, 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 uh, more, more thoughts here on on some of this. So, so here's here's my question here. So, I find all of these things fascinating. So, in the United States, we have this uh, sort of uh, uh, pornography of diversity and 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 how diverse we are, and all of these things, as if we're the first country to be diverse with different <laughs> races and ethnicities, right? Which is dem- demonstrably false. Um, obviously, there's some uniqueness to the United States, but. When you look at history or when you look at different parts of the world uh, that have much longer histories, you're talking millennium, you see that within a nation state currently that so many of these nations have so many ethnic groups. So if before we, you know, the nation state idea is a more modern concept, we go back two, 300 years ago, certainly we have various empires uh, that are, are um, dominating big areas of land. Um, but, you know, if you take uh, something like Spain, let's say, people might be familiar with this more, more than the knots, or maybe they won't. But in Spain, you have people from Catalonia. Uh, they have their own language, their own history, their own culture. They fight with <laughs> uh, other, other, you know, Spain as, 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 you know, the monarch and things like that. You have people in Andalusia, you have people in Galicia, you have people in obviously in Mallorca, the Canary Islands, you have people um, in Basque country. Uh, there, there's, and these are all different ethnic groups, different language, different histories. You know, there's overlap, but in, so when you think of someone that's a Spaniard, it's like, well, we're in Spain, right? Are they in the northwest? Are they in the southeast? Are they in the 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 the, the northeast over in Catalonia? And on and on it goes. And if you go to other places around the world, uh, Turkey has you know uh, four billion different ethnic groups. There's so many ethnic groups in Turkey, um, and, and and many other places. So somewhere in the book, you you say that territory is what states and societies make of it really what are people de- determining what is this this is a group of people that have lived in maybe this area uh, and we've coalesced around various things and so this is who we are there's things where people come in a lot of these are very long histories how do you have in a modern age people that are have that are from different ethnic groups that have migrated or 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 been displaced or things like that, different ethnic groups, different histories, all these things in different territories, let's say previously. And now they're being kind of like you're saying, like with your France example, they're just dumped into France and it's like, or Spain or whatever. And it's like, well, yeah, but like, that's, 
that's not the specifics of what it is for us as an ethnic group or as a as a as a as a as a population group, right? So now my question here is, is so what makes up the territories of sorts of like how much it is people that are driving this? But in the modern state, if you want totally different groups that aren't under empire, because I think that there are mm, the finer sides of empire is that it did have an organizational structure of how to manage different groups and different people in different places, right? There are many awful things about empire for sure. Um, so, but there, it did have some administrative uh, components to it. So you, you, you throw in here, nationalism is not nationalism a way in a modern age of saying, hey, we recognize there's a lot of people with different histories, different ethnic groups, um, you know, obviously positive and negative histories, of course different, slightly variants on culture and maybe the language, but you know what? We all live inside this country, so you can keep your ethnic pride, and, and that's wonderful, but number one, or very, very at the top should be, in a modern state, if we don't want empire, let's have allegiance to the nation. We're going we're gonna to promote this sort of healthy nationalism. Now, I know this makes people sort of squeamish about you know, you're a nationalist or whatever. I'm not, <laughs> not necessarily trying to make that argument, but how, because what are the alternatives? You can coalesce around religion. There's definitely many issues with that. You can coalesce around ethnicity. There's different issues with that. It can become this kind of in-group, out-group thing. You can coalesce around a variety of different things, but wouldn't in a modern state, when you have people from territories previously with these groups, wouldn't it be advantageous to have some form of healthy nationalism to say, this is what we can coalesce around. So that way we have shared interest. We can have a, a similar way of moving about and deciding what we want to do together. Or is this just too varied based on the, on the history of the country or whatever? So I know I kind of threw a bunch of things there, but what do you think about what I'm, what I'm piecing so, I mean, here? If I can, if I can, if I'm tracking correctly. So here's what I'll say. The old empires, to say traditional empires, uh, can be colonial overseas empires, a different kind of business. But all empires like 15th century, 16th century, also in Europe, uh, they are a different kind of animal. And I think that's one reason why I have a, half a chapter on Ottoman Empire. So Ottoman Empire was, a, was not unique, so it was a typical traditional land empire. And it's, I mean, they were not angels. But I mean, no. compared with, you know, it's a modern nation state form. And they did not try to homogenize populations necessarily deeply that they were ruling over. They just ruled on the cheap, this and that. Mm -hmm. uh, but once you have an ideology in town called nationalism, that old imperial model, just the tradition, not only the traditional empires, but also overseas empires become rather unsustainable in the long run. So mm -hmm. once you have a new ideational game and, and nationalism in so many ways, and if that's my interpretation when it comes to national, there are so many different interpretations. The one that I stick to, mm -hmm. I wouldn't say my interpretation, the interpretation that I would stick to, mm -hmm. the spread of nationalism takes place in especially 19th, 20th centuries, two forms. One is emulation. So there has to be an original proof of concept. In so many ways, uh, revolutionary France and the Napoleonic France ends up as perhaps the first proto-nation state. Not perfect, but the first proto-nation state. And it just is able to display its political and military power. And eventually this affects, let's say, Prussia. This eventually affects other countries in Europe. So more and more across the globe, there's this notion of emulation. So existing political actors, existing state leaders, they may say, you know what? Uh, I used to be the state. I used to be like Louis XIV. I am the state. So I, I am the Sun King. But you know what? Maybe it's better for me when dealing with other nation states who can raise far larger armies, who can just motivate their people far more efficiently. Maybe I should also stop claiming that I am the first, you know, citizen. I, I am the king, you guys are the subjects. Maybe it's better to say I'm, you know, German, I'm French, but I'm the first French. I am, a, I am the first servant of the 
French nation or the German nation, what have you. So there's the emulation element, and we can see the trend in many parts of the world, also in the post-colonial or decolonization efforts. But there's also the notion also in relation that emulation is the first one, emancipation is the second one. So when, when we're thinking about, say, all traditional empires, nationalism is back in the day, 200 years ago, is a different concept than the nationalism that we see today. Because nationalism today is like a negative concept, mm -hmm. especially in the Western world. So it's just like, it, it means bad things. So I try yeah. to approach it as an analytical concept. So say late 19th or 19th century, early 20th century, nationalism becomes uh, a tool for emancipation for social, so, certain social groups and political entrepreneurs. For example, in the Ottoman case, and it's so, sort of surprising that Ottoman Empire ruled all, in, all the way into the Balkans, controlled most of the Balkans, also the Middle East, also you know Asia Minor, Anatolia, most of present Turkey. Mm -hmm. And they had a lot of rebellions, but mostly, not entirely, but mostly in the Turkish heartland, as people would call it, in, in Asia Minor, Anatolia, and not so many like religion-driven or large-scale uprisings in the Balkans. So this is sort of surprising. So you would expect, with our nationalistic eyes, the Serbs, the Greeks, what have you, to rise up far earlier. But they rise up, uh, especially after nationalism becomes a viable political ideology for eman emancipation from your overlord, as you perceive them. And that is more or less how say, nationalism works through emancipation. It becomes a tool for emancipation. It becomes a tool for not only getting rid of your imperial overlords, it also means a, t it means a tool for uh, emancipating yourself from the feudal system, from, you know, aristocracy or local aristocracy, maybe a path to modernization, maybe a path to, say, early capitalism, nationalization, whatever. So it becomes a thing. But there's always this single concept that's, sort of affecting how nationalism is spreading hmm. or how nationalism is taking place. It, the word is power. Hmm. So in a normatively, say, objective world, maybe we can say, oh, why, why don't these individuals do this and that? Which I think is a very legitimate question. But as a political scientist, as someone who studied almost his entire professional life, how organized violence and power politics work, power interferes with how we end up with these nation states of power relations within those nation states emerge. If you look at Spain, and I lived in Catalonia, in Barcelona mm -hmm. for, for almost two years. Mm -hmm. So the dominant narrative in Spain uh, is that it's a Spanish nation state, right? Spain is a Spanish nation state. And compared with some other alternatives, historically speaking, Spain, even from the days of like you know, Philip II, like all the way to you know, 15th, 16th, 17th centuries, old Spain, the state has not been very robust as a bureaucratic entity. So it has, it has fared far less, far less well than, say, France I mean, in terms of state reach. But the dominant power within the Spanish state or kingdom of Spain has been Spaniard. So when, when Europe was being shaped in terms of the nation state form, who is the dominant political group or actor in this country we call now Spain? But the Spaniards... And be, you know, drawing on that nation-state model, they tried to make Spain a Spanish nation-state. And trying to do that, you've got to sort, follow certain procedures. And I think another example is Turkey. You have to homogenize education. You have to homogenize language. You have to homogenize bureaucracy. You have to homogenize laws and regulations to do the best way you can. Uh, but in the end, that's just a power relationship. So it was the Spaniards who were the powerful actors or the Spanish king, what have you. And that led Spain to a certain historical path. That also left like the Basque country, Catalonia, as not integral parts of Spain. But that is what some Catalans or you know, folks in Basque country may feel. So for the central government, central, you know, animus, political body politic. Spain is an indivisible territorial unit. It's the home of the Spanish nation state. Mm -hmm. It's what the dominant narrative is in Spain. Well, Catalans, and some Catalans, maybe most Catalans, don't buy into that argument. Right. Well, in Basque country, a lot of people don't buy into that argument. But in the end, it's a power relationship. If Catalans could figure out a way to go independent and they create their own Catalan nation state, mm -hmm. 
they could have, maybe they would have. But in the end, so historical contingencies lock most of these disparate societies in the same game. And it's a catch-22. More the Spanish central government in the past, maybe even today, press for creating an all Spanish identity, the more of a reaction you would expect to have from the Catalans. And it becomes a catch to win a two game. The Spanish state or Spanish government, governments legitimize themselves as the representative of all Spanish territories. So no politician would easily want to be the guy who say, I lost Catalonia, right? So right. there's a power dynamic going and I think that sort of affects how we think about the nation state form. And that is, the, that is one purpose I tried to, I decided to write the book because this is a, this, we take the nation state form just like we take territoriality as a given. But once you look a little bit closer, there are so many contradictions attached to it. Mm -hmm. And the other reason that I thought this might be a good time to write a book like this is with immigration, with you know, refugees, with all these mm -hmm. you know, population transfers, mobilization, this and that. You, in time and not long time, our conceptions of the nation state form will be challenged yeah. in dramatic forms. All these, yes. for, for example, what is Germany or where is Germany? What is Germany? If you look, if you jump into a time machine, go to say 400, 500 years back, we would have a concept called Germania, but it won't be the same Germany that we presently imagine. If you jump to say 20th century German nation state, is in fact this smaller representation of the German, Germanic peoples, because Austria is out, this and that. But in the end, German state, as we have come to know, uh, up until especially World War II, and World War II is another step, it is a state and a territory for German, for the Germans. Right? Now, with the rising levels of immigration and refugees, even that interpretation is being challenged. Can we still say Germany is the land of ethnic Germans, or maybe Germany, what Germany is, should be interpreted in a different way. So Germany is a cosmopolitan territorial entity where Germans are in majority. So eventually, we may still not see how big of a challenge this is. Maybe we are seeing it, but I think this is going to be a challenge for most of the old nations. And I think if United States has one advantage, it does not have the same historical baggages that, say, most European countries or most countries in the old world have. And I would, I would separate countries in the old world into two, those who have been more or less independent-ish, if you can just trace back in time, and those who have to live through colonization then become independent mm. after colonization. Mm. So the United States on that level, uh, in this coming age of population movements, immigration refugees is more of an advantage because the, the nation form is not defined in terms of necessarily ethnic group. It's basically allegiance to the constitution, allegiance to the homeland, and the United States have always been a you know, mix. But I would say from a territorial perspective, it's a proper nation state. So, yeah. so in the United States, you, you know, if someone of, if I ask this question in my classes most of the time, I ask my students, or if you had the option, well, you have Toronto in Canada and you have just anywhere, Lincoln in Nebraska. Well, you know, from a number of perspectives, you know, Toronto, owning Toronto might be more beneficial than Lincoln, Nebraska for a number of reasons. And as my students, most of whom are Americans, would you trade Toronto for, you know, Lincoln, Nebraska? And many say, no way. That's unimaginable. I'm saying, but it makes more sense from a financial perspective maybe even nightlife perspective, and they would say, no, 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 this is American homeland. We're just not trading it for anything. So they, 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 so in that sense, United States is, for, for me, from a territorial perspective, not from an ethnic perspective, it's a proper nation state, territorial nation state. But with the coming challenge, arguably, United States and similar countries like Canada maybe can deal with it. it it's going to be very problematic for old European nation states to handle that transformation. I think we're already seeing back and forth how this territorial identity and challenges to it can affect even domestic politics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I you're 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 right on where I wanted to go with this. So I figured we could use three examples of this. So Germany is one of them, uh Turkey is one of them, and then 
the United States. Now, in the beginning of uh, of your book, you you give it was a great way of of of, of uh, kind of illustrating your your whole your whole uh, claims here. You get this idea of you know what is Germany and what is it to be German, right? What are the social political uh, components to this? And in many ways, when you have the unification in 1871 to create Germany, right, as a country, a, na- a nation state, if you will, I mean, they, you had the, 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 uh, the monarchy or whatever it was, but you, you, have, um, you have that until the war, and then you get East and West Germany for 40 years, and then there's a kind of reunifying again, and, you know, it's kind of the current state. So, you know, Germany as a country... You know, in in the way in which we understand countries is pretty young. Uh, Obviously, there's, you know, Prussia and things like that beforehand. But it's a question of, you know, even people like Friedrich Nietzsche, people like uh, Wagner, they were like, well, what's what's German? What's German art? What's German literature? German music? German? Like they were trying to figure out what that is. Right. And how do you coalesce that around some kind of, of nationalism? The story is is a little bit different with Turkey. Um, so obviously there was Ottoman Empire for six hundred plus years, and then uh, after you know World War One, it kind of uh, dissolves. But uh, I had a uh, I had on uh, Adam Mishtayan. He's a, a historian, and he wrote this really great book called Modern Arab Kingship. And he has this. I don't you know. It's, he talks about it in the book. I don't know if it's specifically his idea, but this idea of recycling empire that right in the 1920s you had this in Syria you had this in Egypt you had this in a lot of places in the region uh, and, and with Turkey where it's yeah you know we don't have empire but we're gonna have these nation states and we're gonna coalesce around the nation but it's basically kind of similar to how the empire was right a lot of the legal codes a lot of the same procedural things obviously there's differences at the beginning it's, it's a little bit different now. But this idea of like, well, you know, my understanding is, I mean, obviously you'll know more than I will, but, you know, Turkey is an interesting idea of sorts of, in a modern way of the language is a sort of a creation of sorts. It's, it's, it's a, it's a, there's a tur- the Turkish language and there's co- combinations of things. Um, obviously it was, I think, designed to be a secular state. It was not designed to be uh, religious in any way. Of course, I think that's changed a little bit over more recent years uh, for better or for worse. So there's an interesting thing of like, well, what does it be, mean? Like you have the Turks, right? You have, you know, Turkish people. There's an ethnic group of, Tur- uh, of the Turks, but you also have so many other ethnic groups, um, so many. Um, and so it's like, okay, you know, the Kurds, you have Circassians, you have, you have all these different people that have been immigrating there. Um, so what does it mean post-Ottoman to be... Turkish, like, what does that mean, right? What does that mean at this point? And then third, and finally, you have the United States. And I kind of push back on people with this. So, you know, you've heard this, right? People will say, well, you know, the United States is just an idea. It can be whatever you want it to be, right? We don't have all of this baggage, right? Kind of what you were saying. We don't have all this all this stuff, you know, if you come here and you, you know, allegiance to the declaration and the idea of what, you know, constitution, the idea of it, you're American, the, you know, that's it, right? You don't need to have all these things. And I don't disagree with that, but I think it's more than that. As we, you know, we're 250 years or whatever it is. Um, as we keep going further, you have people that have generations of living here and they're contributing to a history and a culture in the United States that it is. You cannot just say, well, I'm going to make it whatever I want it to be. There is a type of history and culture you have to um, be considerate of. You can become a part of that more, maybe more easily, but it's not just an idea. It's not just you like the Constitution, Declaration of Independence, boom, there you go. I think culturally, this is why we're in the United States having these arguments. Because I, I always see any, any, any discussions around migration or immigration as one side of a coin and on the other side is nationalism. Because that's really what people care about is, well, who are we? Who are the people we have here? Uh, what does that do with our culture? Is it too fast? Is it too slow? Is it too many? Is it too few? What do we do with people that come from other places? Because there's a kind of worry or a fear 
But you lose collective identity. You lose a sense of what it means to be American or something else. And so, yes, United States is a different kind of uh, country, and it's a younger one, and it has some advantages to having less baggage, uh, kind of in what you're meaning from other countries. But it does have some of, I think, these other things that I'm saying as well. So uh, how do you see in each of these examples, in the German example, the, the Turkish example, and then maybe the American one, these different ways of how we understand um, identity and nationalism and, and how we understand what that means for peoples there? Great question. So I'll first kick it off with two minor com- minor comments. Yeah. The first is, I mean, thanks for saying those things about the first chapter with Germany and Turkey as two examples. They didn't exist in the version that I submitted to Oxford University Press. Oh, but one of the reviewers say, you know, well, okay, fine, fine. But, well, I mean, it take it's it's a little clunky of a book, so why don't you come up with a first chapter, mm. much lighter, more for the broader audiences? Uh, so in those in in, this, in that chapter in your stories, you don't go too deep, but you give enough of the insights through examples to push forward your story, to procure your narrative. And my editor agreed. So that is the reason I have a first chapter that's much easier to read through. It's a good chapter. It's good. Thank you. So, I mean, that, that is the reason I just ended up with that chapter. That was not what I initially thought, but I think it just turned out better. And the second point is similar. The reason I added Turkey in the first chapter, and Turkey is just like an example that comes and goes. So, you know, there's some Ottoman Empire, but not much on Turkey. And this, you know, Shameless self-promotion and uh, promotion in that sense. So my new, my current book that I'm working on will more or less look into the notion of identity, territory, geopolitics, focusing only on the Turkish case in the last oh, nice. hundred years, mostly on the 20 years. Very nice. So, you know, that, that is something that I've been working on. But mm. going, going back to Germany, I think this is sort of, I kind of like, enjoyed writing the first chapter where I looked at the two tales of two countries, Germany and Turkey. The more, the more we dig into the story of what Germany or where Germany is, it gets more complicated. Uh-huh. So there's the German culture, German literature, German architecture. I mean, there's the cultural aspects of it. And one thing that's sort of specific about Germany is... Uh, there's not after the empire, the original empire. Mm-hmm. There's not much of a un- unique political entity. That's why I think the power element comes along. So Germanic, you know, territories or territories we can call Germanic. Even that is open to discussion because we are looking at the past with present lenses. They are so divided. There are dozens of Germanic states competing with each other, small or big. Eventually, we have modern Germany or modern-day Germany, something that resembles it, that evolves out of Prussia. Mm. But even then, not all German, not all German majority territories are incorporated in the modern Germany. So Austria, uh, Habsburgs, more or less are left out, this and that. There's the there's argument about big Germany or small Germany. You know, Prussia ends up with small Germany. And then there's World War I, there's massive population exchanges, there's massive territory. So World War, in Germany, even after World War I, doesn't look like that much, you know, like Germany before World War, or Germany of 1871. And after World War II, I mean, the population and the territory changes. Germany goes westwards by about like, I think, 40 to 60 miles. I'm talking about millions of people, population exchange are just withering away. And Germany broken into two. One becomes, uh, you know, democratic, West Allied. The other becomes Soviet, more or less garrison state. And then we had a combination. Uh, we had the unification in, after the Cold War, or at the very end tale of Cold War. And right now, what it what does it mean to be German? And Germany has a history of immigration, especially Turkish immigrants, millions right now. But in the end. It's been a challenge for a German society to assimilate them. Maybe still struggling with that. And in the last five to ten years, there's more of an influx of immigration, immigrants and refugees. And I think this is creating uh, all the tension, most of the tension that we see in German domestic politics. So we have the rise of 
you know, far right or right, whatever you can call it. And we have a lot of different tensions. So I think, to me, German politics is troubled by this question of what does it mean to be Germany? So, and at the same time, what does it mean to be German? Mm-hmm. Is German, like it was used to be interpreted in the past, someone who was born into German blood? Mm-hmm. So Germany had this very specific system where, you know, if you can prove your German blood, you'll get citizenship right away, even though you couldn't hold that thing as secondary citizenship. Uh, but right now, Germany is struggling with this question of what does what is Germany and what does it mean to be German? Is it about being born in Germany? Like United States kind of citizenship, if you were born and raised in the United States, well, it's all taken care of. But if you were born to Turkish immigrants in Germany, are you Turkish? Are you Turkish German? Or are you German plus German full stop? So as far as I think Germany and most of the European countries are concerned, the challenge is coming. And I think that would be a challenge in terms of what does it mean to be us? What what do these territories mean? And I, I, I don't have any optimistic projections into that. That's a, that's a question that Europe will have to grapple with because Europe is going one direction for further integration. Uh, on, on, the, on the other hand, there's the refugee immigration, immigrant influx. And I think European Union as an experiment is trying to break out of that nation state territorial mm. you know, trap. So, mm. But again, it's not easy and there's always going to be a you know, push back. So it's not going to be easy. So you say somewhere in Brussels, so some European leaders come together and say, well, you know what? This nation state model is not working out anymore. So maybe we should go for a superior model. That's like the one that you suggested yourself like a couple of, you know, you know, moments ago, but why can't the Catalans and Basque folks come together? So they may think that way, but there's always going to be the power struggle element. So that'll be Forces with, from within the European population will say, no, you just want to, don't want to do that. If you want some integration with other European countries, even that does not work for, for all European countries, say Britain. But what are we going to do with this new, you know, billions of people coming in? It's, it's changing how that nation state model worked out. Mm. So I think from a territorial perspective, especially for Europe, maybe European Union in particular, uh, this is going to be a challenging century. Mm. Well, it, maybe that will not be the wars of the previous century or the mm-hmm. centuries before, but in terms of defining what it means to be German, what it means to be Germany, uh, I think where Germany is more stabilized right now, thank God, so we don't have to worry about that. But that, that'll that be their issue. When it comes to Turkey, I would say, and again, I'm saving this for the next book. But mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Give, us, give us the preview. Give us the preview. Turkey's in a way, I, I don't want to go for Turkish exceptionalism, but Turkey mm-hmm. is sort of exceptional, as I mentioned, in one key domain. It is not that it's an, it inherited some territory from a you know, good-sized empire. It was able to escape direct colonization or even quasi-colonization. So if you look at non-Western societies uh, across the globe, there are so few examples where we can say, "Oh, you know, this is mm-hmm. this is now an independent mm-hmm. sovereign nation state," yeah. and they did they became independent nation states or nation state without having to go through a period of colonization. I mean, even with China, we can talk about quasi colonization that in yeah. massive ways. A few examples that I can think of is Siam, then it becomes Thailand, and the other example that I can think of is Japan. But it, you know, after World War II, Japan also had to suffer some, you know, external powers kind of but and Turkey is one of them. But the interesting thing about Turkey to me, even the term Turkey and something I try to highlight in the book, even the term Turkey or the term Turks were used mostly by the Europeans before ethnic Turks or Ottoman rulers called themselves Turks mm-hmm. or Turkey. Mm-hmm. So it was a negative designation that Europeans used for centuries. So if, if when I look at the old European maps, say, you know, but some of them just represent the Ottoman territories as Turkey. But Ottoman rulers did not have a conception that can be compared. They did not think of the territories they ruled as Turkey. They were it was Ottoman territories. And Ottoman referring to dynasty. Now as the World War I was coming. There are multiple wars, like the Balkan Wars. So there was a lot of population transfers from the Caucasus, from the Balkans, 
And it was mostly based on religion. So it was not like, hey, I feel myself like a Turk. I live in the Balkans or the Caucasus. Maybe in the Balkans, but not so much in the Caucasus. Uh, there's some pushback because all, all these other new fledgling states, say Serbia or you know, Greece or Bulgaria, they're also trying to homogenize their own societies. And they're trying to homogenize their societies in the simplest, base, most basic form. And back like a century, years ago, a hundred years ago, and then you know, and then fifty years ago, it was mostly religion. So when the Ottomans are losing power, when the other their former colonies are becoming more like nation states, there's a pushback. So a lot of Muslims from the Balkans, from Greece, they also moved to move to Ottoman Empire. So for example, it's it's great that you mentioned. So my ancestors also moved from Abkhazia. So it's, mm. it's, yeah, I'm sort of half Circassian in that sense. So mm. I, I know mm -hmm. the story myself too. Mm. And we're talking about like Circassians. They're not Turks, not by a long shot, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. not linguistically, not ethnically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, they were Muslim enough. They were mostly Muslims. And when the Russians were just trying to get rid of them, they, they didn't have much of an option. They just had to go to the Ottoman Empire. Mm -hmm. And eventually, modern Turkey is founded on the ashes of, not the Ottoman Empire, on the ashes of the territory that was left of the Ottoman Empire. So the Ottoman Empire collapsed. Some, part, some territorial parts of the Ottoman Empire ended up as Turkey. And the founding fathers of Turkey and it also depends on who the founding father was. The founding father of Turkey, Mustafa Kemal Ataturk, he decided to go with this nation-state form. Mm -hmm. he, could, he could have unitary nation-state form. He could have gone with a federation. He could have gone with a confederation. And we're talking about a certain period in time where to count, to avoid colonization or quasi-colonization, you have to prove to the Western world that you are also a nation-state. Mm -hmm. And Turkey, uh, under Ataturk, Partially, maybe Atatürk preferred the nation-state form, partially because if you go for any other form other than the nation-state form, like unitary, discrete borders, social spatial homogenization, you were facing the risk of colonization or facing mm -hmm. outside attack. So whatever reason, Turkey decides to go for uh, a nation-state form. I mean, if, then the Turkey or Turkey starts to make sense. Tur Turkey means simply the land of the Turks. Mm -hmm. But the problem for the early founding fathers was at least twofold. First, we're talking about a multi-ethnic empire. A lot, lot of, you know, say, ethnic Turks, but at the same time, a lot of Kurds, a lot of Circassians, a lot of you know, more Christian groups, which eventually, most of which eventually left Turkey you know, over the matter of last hundred years. So it's a, it's a mix. And the, the societies living in those territories, the new territory, the Turkish national homeland, do not have a good sense of what Turkey might be, what it means to be Turkish, right? And so the central government took a number of measures to install that identity. Mm -hmm. So the first problem, as I said, was ethnic mix, linguistic mix. The second problem for modern Turkey was, as you just mentioned yourself, the founding fathers decided to create a secular territory in Turkey. So, so secular-ish, not entirely secular, because they also tried to control states. Uh, they tried to control state institutions to control religion or interpretation of religion. So it was not like a total separation of states and religion. It was like states trying to shape or contain religion, but also, you know, downplaying it. So in so many ways, the original nation-state building formula in Turkey, succeeded in some dimensions. Uh, it, it was able to create, say, I don't know, maybe a good sense of Turkish nationalism for some of the people, a good sense of established secularism for some of the citizens. But at the same time, it backfired, especially among the Kurds, and in terms of this national uniqueness or national cohesion, and also it backfired in terms of secularism. So, mm. Fast forward 80 years, I mean, we have a new president for, he's been old, but he's, he's been out there for 25 years. We have Recep Tayyip Erdogan, who openly sort of, I think, believes that the nation state form never actually fat, fit Turkey. Mm. So if that is the case, how can you just remake it? So I think in so many ways, the Turkish president and his government are trying to make present-day Turkey 
an abbreviated version of the old Ottoman Empire. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So less less secular, more like religion defined. And Turkey has its own share of immigrants and refugees, but mostly from Sunni majority countries. So depending on whom you ask, you'd be talking about six to 13 million mm-hmm. refugees mm-hmm. Uh, being sort of injected to a country that does not have a similar experience like the United States to assimilate yeah. or incorporate all these refugees. So Turkey right now, and that will be the theme of the book, mm. uh, is so much different from the vision that uh, the founding fathers, you know, thought about. But it's not going to be like the old Ottoman Empire millet system. Well, it's, well, it's going to be a postmodernist vision. Yeah, and and you know, I mean, uh, I followed the uh, the the election earlier that, or last year a little closely, and it seems mm-hmm. interesting. I was sort of surprised Erdogan got reelected. I mean, he the, the whole earthquake thing was pretty terrible, and how he handled it, and all these things. And there was other, you know, obviously, inflation was. It was over 80% at one point. It was crazy. It was like, you know, so many things. And he still won re-election, which was, I know the other major, major uh, candidate was, you know, okay, kind of milk toast, And then he kind of said a few weird things towards the end of the election cycle. And I guess people just were like, maybe not. But I guess it's interesting that he, enough people, I guess you should say, uh, said that they, you know, should keep him again. I mean, he, he, he's been winning for like 21 years. Yeah. And going back to your original question about the future of Turkey from a territorial perspective, uh, I assume I am expecting to go for, for Turkey to go through a territorial crisis or identity crisis mm. in the next five to 10 years for different reasons than, say, European Union in terms of the mm. refugees and immigration. The rationale will be different, but the outcome might be similar in some way. So you have in Turkey the rise of far-right anti-refugee movements. And in fact, some of the hardcore seculars and some of the hardcore ultranationals are coming together Mm. to confront that. But I mean, in terms of political power, Erdogan controls everything. And even though Erdogan is somewhat sometimes called in the Western press of far right, in terms of refugees and you know immigrants, Erdogan would put some of the most radical leftist liberal politicians sure. yeah. in Europe to shame. So oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. in terms of how he's trying to uh, how, how many how many, how many millions of Syrians has Turkey taken in over the past now, 12 I'll, years? I'll be honest, no no one really knows. But if, yeah. if you ask if you ask the United Nations, the the number should be 3.6 million, but has it's to be more. 3.6 million has for, to be more. since like yeah. you know, forever. Yeah. And and the government is very not so specific about actual numbers. So the far right folks would just put the number at 13. I think that might be a little too much, but if I have to make an educated guess and that doesn't build on any like serious data because there are lots of mm-hmm. data, but I don't know which one to trust. I would put the number probably on at least five to six Syrians and maybe mm. Three to five million uh, refugees or immigrants from other countries. To one detail to highlight in terms of uh, Turkey, which you may find interesting, which I think is interesting. That's going to be one of the themes of the next book. Is the old secular, you know, nationalist Turkey was so anti Middle Eastern in terms of you know, social cultural association. Interesting. So back in the 50s, they had, from the Turkish perspective, that's the old Turkey, that's the secular elite run, run Turkey. They put a stipulation to Turkish participation, Geneva Con- Convention. Mm-hmm. So in Turkey, to be classified or categorized as a refugee, as a legal refugee, mm. you have to come from Europe. So if you are someone coming from, say, the Middle East or North Africa, Anywhere other than Europe, you cannot even, st- you know, stay in the country as a legal refugee. Hmm. So the, the old Turkey was the, was so much against the Middle Eastern heritage, the culture. At least having people from the Middle East, wow. they stipulated that. Even to this day, we're talking about Syrian refugees uh, because I don't think there's an appropriate word for English for their actual legal status. So we hmm. use refugees. As a shortcut, they're not legal refugees. They are under temporary protection. 
Mm. So, and the re- one reason they can't be called legal refugees is a stipulation some 70 years ago that the old guard, the secular old guard of Turkey put forward. Mm. So Erdogan is completely changing that. So Erdogan yeah. is changing what it means to be Turkey. Uh, it's, he's not necessarily changing where Turkey is, but he, he's changing what kind of territory Turkey is going to be in the coming decade. It's not going to be the territory unit that I was born into some four or six years ago, or I grew up. It's going to be a different kind of territory. Unit. It's going to be much more cosmopolitan, much more probably conservative, or much more of a mix. So I think in, in terms of Turkey, this territorial dimension, once you think about it, Hmm. points towards a new kind of Turkey. It's not going to be the same Turkey. It's going to be a different kind of Turkey. It's just going to be the theme of the next book that I'm working on. Yeah. In terms of United States, I, maybe because I'm a naturalized citizen who's seen the old world, who's been around different countries, and I like that visiting, actually living there. And I think United Kingdom is similar, but I think United States is a advantage over that. The current numbers, current debates, I can't get into because I that's not my specialty. But in terms of my reading into you know of the past of the United States, here's what I can say. Uh, in the past, there were also multiple ethnic groups that flooded into the United States in large numbers, say early twentieth, early twentieth century, yeah. late nineteenth century. You have the Irish, you have the Italians, the Germans. When they first come in, mm-hmm. they don't speak the language Irish speak, but they may they may have they were not, you know, they were Catholics, but Italians were Catholics. So this and that, you know, there there were multiple societal issues. But fast forward hundred years, now Irish Americans or Italian Americans, when I meet them, they're some of the proudest American Know, patries that I could meet. So I think United States has had that kind of experience. So I'm, I'm not saying what might be happening right now is not just going to change it. What I'm trying to highlight is different from, say, Germany, different from Turkey or modern Turkey, United States. Even though you say like a young country, when I, how I think about it, Turkey as a state is younger, ah, much yeah. younger than. Mm-hmm. Uh, the culture might be old, mm-hmm. but, you know, mm-hmm. or the, the existing culture might be older for a millennia, but as a country with institutions and all that, mm. Turkey is younger. Even Germany, the modern Germany might have been seen. If it's 1871, mm. it's younger than the United States. So the United States have for centuries lived with this. And from what I can see, it's just an issue of how fast and how far it can incorporate new coming folks. And again, that is a that is an argument that I would not want to get too much in detail, but I remain on the optimistic side as someone who's seen firsthand how accommodating the United States can be because I'm a U.S. citizen, but I just was naturalized some you know, almost 15 years ago. You know, it's, it's worked out so far great for me. It's in, not for me. I just don't feel like outside this and that. But again, who knows? So, but that is something the nation state from, from a territorial perspective, since we are so attached to it, that is something that's going to be challenged more and more. And initially, what many people thought in 1990s when it comes to the future of the nation state, future of the territorial state, many people believed the globalization, you know, trade, this and that would, would just pose a great threat or, to the nation state form or challenge to nation state form. Maybe it was defunct anymore. What I'm seeing, and that's also in the book partially, what I'm seeing is that nation state form as an ideal, as a model, is still strong. Mm-hmm. And the more challenge you put into the nation state form, it's so established, it reacts back. Mm-hmm. Right? German, you know, German politicians can say, you know what, we can just get rid of this old Germany conception as a homogeneous territorial unit. But that, that model is so strong, the more pressure you put on the model, some other politicians and people will come back and say, no, we don't want to go there. Mm-hmm. Again, I think for Europe, it's going to be, well, the struggle of the century. I guess. <laughs> yeah. For yeah. Turkey, it's going to be, you know, it's going to be some struggle, but probably much less so because the dominant political actor in the country want to integrate, mm. say, immigrants and refugees. Mm. Mm. The United States, well, well, we'll wait and see what's going to happen. Mm-hmm. But I think mm-hmm. United States, even though most Americans don't think themselves as nationalists, they would like to use the word. Patriot, and also in Europe, that's the same thing too. 
and I would not challenge that conception, but from an analytical perspective, uh, when someone comes and tells me, oh, you know what? There's no nationalism in America. I'm like, okay, from a territorial perspective, well, there's something that, and, and as an as a implant, I can see maybe more so than some born and raised Americans, what brings Americans together, what keeps them together. And I, I can see Americans' sensitivity for homeland, this and that. These are more or less what I think when I say territorial nationalism. You don't mm-hmm. have to call it nationalism, but you can call it patriotism, or someone can call it patriotism. But for me, from an political perspective, in the United States, one of the least ethnically driven states in the world, the territorial nationalism, which does not require ethnic nationalism, mm-hmm, is very mm-hmm, robust. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. In yeah. fact, I, I would argue that territorial nationalism may be even more robust in countries like the United States. Mm-hmm. Right? Because it's not the ethnicity that keeps mm-hmm, it together. Mm-hmm. It's, it's the respect or sense for the homeland, isn't that? Yeah, yeah. These are my like... You know, four to five minute answers to your very simple questions. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I totally agree with you about it. I certainly think most Americans are nationalistic. I that that has I don't know why that is. I'm sure there's stuff been written on it, but I don't know why uh nationalism gets such a dirty kind of word kind of thing. It, it is a history. It, it's basically it has a lot to do with World War Two, you know, heritage. So yeah, in World which, War which II, is fair. Which is fair. I mean, it does have uh, negative components for sure. But I think there is a kind of benign <laughs> or you know kind of healthy nationalism. Most people call that patriotism, like you're saying. But I think really, I mean, I see it more as a kind of nationalism, which it doesn't bother me. I think it's you have to stay away from like the ugly side of it. But I definitely think Americans are that way for sure. Absolutely. I mean, as far as their territorial attachments, this is what I would say. When I look at the United States, I see you know the impacts of territorial nationalism. When I look at other countries, I see that too. some other countries, maybe not so much, but for the United mm-hmm. States, the attachment to the homeland is real. I mean, Americans can disagree among this and that, but attachment to the homeland to me is a dominant, mm-hmm. say, mm-hmm. It's, you know, sentiment yeah. shared by many Americans. Yeah, yeah, no, I totally agree with you. So <clears throat> let me ask a, a few a few things here about we can talk about conflict a little bit. Uh, that's super important. You've mentioned a few times power, but um, when we talk about defining borders uh you mentioned in the book it's probably in the middle of the book uh the peace of westphalia this is westphalia is i mean such a historical significant moment all these things talk set that up for us and how this really pushes or helps us understand the ideas we have around borders and territories and and then we can talk a little bit about conflict i think so in, in international relations literature maybe also in international politics the, the term Westphalia has reached, in the last 70, 80 years, maybe more than that, a mythical status. Mm. So once we refer to Westphalia, that was what we were told when I was an undergrad back in Turkey. A piece of Westphalia is the beginning of the modern state system. This and that. And this has been a very, very powerful myth. So well, what was piece of Westphalia? So long story short, in 1517, we have the rise of Protestantism. Up until that point, most European, you know, kings and princes, queens, what have you, they're Catholics. There's the Pope. I mean, the Protestant the rise of Protestantism leads to some tensions, this and that. And eventually, you know, after a very conflict-ridden century, we had the Thirty Years' War, kicking off in 1618. This is like, and that was like one of the most deadliest uh, experiences that Europe has ever experienced. You know, experienced. And the war actually lasts 30 years. In 1648, we have the Peace of Westphalia. It's not the Treaty of Westphalia. Even Harry, you know, Harry Kissinger makes that mistake, or me used to make that mistake. It's a Peace of Westphalia comprised of two separate treaties. Now, what does that do? It basically is a way to limit uh, use of religion or you know, using religion as an excuse to fight other countries, other princes, what have you. So because the violence is very difficult to control. And if after 30 years of fighting, none of the European princes, you know, queens and kings, what have you, they don't want to do this anymore. So one way for them to solve this is, okay, let's try to come up with clearer understandings of boundaries. 
And this is a time when modern cartography is just taking off the ground. So mm. arguably Louis XIV was the first French king to see the map of France in more or less accurate terms. Mm. So this doesn't work out like overnight, but the understanding is we should have clearer boundaries and within those boundaries, we should have a principle of autonomy. So if I'm the prince of country A or you know, kingdom A, you're the prince of you know, kingdom B, we may or may not share the same religious sectarian affiliations. Our populations may differ. Doesn't matter. Let's not use religion as an excuse to intervene with each other's affairs. So let's try to respect those boundaries. Not I wouldn't even say borders, but something that would approximate border eventually. Let's let's try to respect that boundaries. And within your boundaries, you are the king. You are not the sovereign, but you are the autonomous sector. And I am the autonomous sector within my boundaries. Now, in the international relations literature and in the common usage, the piece of West Valley became something so much more than that. So it became, it evolved into this myth. And arguably, it has a lot to do with how IR international relations think about its own history. And there's one 1988 article by a legal scholar, let's call him Leo Gross, who refers to West Valley, this majestic portal that opened up overnight. And then you have the rise of modern state system as we imagine the modern state system today. And now, multiple scholars, uh, Stephen Kreisner, Ben, you know, ben Otashke, I mean, this myth has been killed many times, but it doesn't die. It's like a zombie kind of a myth. <laughs> so it's, it's a living that. I mean, from a historical perspective, from a sociological perspective, from a diplomatic perspective, it, it is not what we, it was not what some might imagine it to be, but it was still an important point. It's the crust of my book. It still established a more rigorous boundary or bordering practices, and it it's established the background for what we today refer to territorial sovereignty, mm. which is within the within these, I should have discrete borders, and the territories within those borders are within my jurisdiction, and no one else should interfere with mm. what's happening in my territory if I am the sovereign. Mm. But that's a, that's the thing. In the old original West Valley system, it wasn't necessarily the states or the countries, not forget about the nations, it was mostly the rulers themselves. Mm who were the sovereigns. So when a ruler is signing the piece of, you know, a treaty attached to the piece of Westphalia, say Osnabrück, when he, you know, when that person is signing that, he's not signing it for the country, he's signing like his name, his family's name. So that was a thing. But eventually over time, this myth of Westphalia was, became so robust that we ended up associating it with two norms that lies at the heart of international politics even today, norm of territorial sovereignty, which was, a say, more or less an approximation to what happened in Westphalia and the notion of non-intervention, which came up much later, like centuries later. So non-intervention became a norm, like in modern sense. But overall, when we think about peace of Westphalia as international relations scholars, most of us think that it is the birth, you know, it is the birthplace and birth date of the modern state system that magically created all these political maps, political lines mm -hmm. on the global map. Mm -hmm. So it paved the way for it, is my argument, but it did not create them overnight. So mm -hmm. it did it laid the foundations of what's coming, but it did not act as a majestic portal that mm -hmm. changed. Mm -hmm. But when we if you were to trace the notion of territorial sovereignty, much stricter bordering practices, piece of Westphalia was not majestic portal, but it was a sort of breaking point of some sort that triggered the subsequent process. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So with that context, how do you, you talk about in the book, these mosaic and monolithic orders and, and how they're associated with patterns in war and conflict. You also talk about some of the, the dimensions within the European state system. So yeah, talk to us about these kind of, you know, different orders, how they're used, and, and how does this come out of certain conflicts that we see at, at different points in history? Thank you so much. So, you know, tying this all to a piece of Westphalia, the conventional mm -hmm. wisdom in international relations scholarship, maybe in everyday life, among people who, you know, think and talk about international politics, 
Peace of Westphalia is usually seen as the point where the territorial underpinnings of the modern state system, as we understand it, were established. Mm. My argument is, well, sort of, not entirely. The, our present territorial global order is more of a function of the nation state form, mm. which comes later, as opposed to the original you know, Westphalian arrangement. In the original Westphalian arrangement, something important happens. But we are not living in the Westphalian territorial order. We are living in an evolved version of you know, Westphalian territorial model. And I try to differentiate between the original Westphalian model and the nation state model that came later by talking, referring to them two different, as two different territorial models. The first one being the mosaic model, the second one being the monolithic model. The mosaic model was what I believe was the original Westphalian invention. Hmm. And what was it? Back in the day, there's not, in Europe, there's not much of a, a motive or an incentive for the leaders to homogenize their populations. And populations themselves, the societies, did not imagine themselves to be living in this concrete unit, hmm. right? And, you know, someone living in the lands controlled by the Prussian king would probably know Frederick the Great. But they do not. They would not have a good sense of where Prussia is. Maybe they would not even actually care about where Prussia is. So the society, even in back in the day, Prussia was much more mixed than we imagine today. In most of these places, even France was much more mixed. The, the French linguistic and cultural unity uh, can be traced to the beginning of World War One. It's not like nineteen, you know, seventeen eighty nine. French people rise up. Most people in France did not speak French the way people speak French today. So it's a process. So it, back in the day, in you know, Peace of Westphalia, and that's what I think is the mosaic model is, societies were still heterogeneous. The relationship of the society to space was defined in terms of heterogeneity. But one novelty of the Peace of you know, Westphalia, they, it opened the gates for rigid borders. So in the book, you, as you, you know, mentioned, there's a two by two table where I differentiate between different territorial orders or models. And I went for the simplest definition of territory in both international nation literature and political ge geography literature. A territory emerges when human groups demarcate or delineate boundaries mm. and when they organize the space society relationship in some way. And trying to simplify things. In terms of demarcation, I have two potential paths. The one is the most common from a microhistorical perspective, not rigid borders, but fluid frontiers. You don't know where they begin. They may change. They're flexible. The other form is a rigid borders. That's the invention of Peace of Westphalia. Now, in terms of organization of state society, space society relationship, you can go for a homogeneous model. That's the nation state model. Or you can go for a heterogeneous model. This is like, well, Differences are fine. This is like an empire. Now, the mosaic model is a mix between the nation state form and the imperial form. Mm -hmm. In terms of social spatial organization, it is heterogeneous by design, or just no one wants to homogenize space society relationship. In terms of delineation of borders, and that was the invention no longer fluid, flexible frontiers, but more and more rigid borders. So that I call the mosaic model. And I would say we are not living in a world that's, in theory, built on the Westphalian arrangement. Because nationalism, especially over the course of 19th century, even onto the 20th century, changed that format. So if, if the mosaic model is strict borders, but you know, heterogeneous social special organization, nationalism clearly implies strict borders, but homogeneous social spatial organization, a homogeneous society attached to the state. Now, my argument is, and I call this monolithic orders, and my argument is we are living in a monolithic order, at least as an aspirational model, not the mosaic model, the original mm -hmm. Westphalian model, so, which means, if I'm right, the Westphalian myth is mythical, but there's something to appreciate about it, the border part, the border part, but we're living in a different world, and my overall argument is, in a system dominated by mosaic territoriality, you will have different patterns in war, on average, when compared with a 
know, system operating in the dominance of monolithic territoriality. And how do I draw the difference? I think it's, in a way, it's easy to spell out the logic. Imagine you are a prince or a king or a queen in, say, seven, late 17th century Europe. You are king of France, this and that. Now, you know that it's not easy for you to motivate your masses to fight for the territorial integrity of the state. You may care about your territories, but on the one hand, it's difficult for you to motivate the society to fight like as a, as a whole, to fight for that territory. And in, in a way, you as a king or a prince or a queen, you may not want to involve society in politics that much. Mm. Because if you want them to, if you ask them to fight for your territory, because you are the sovereign, you control, you own the land, more or less. If you ask them to die for the territory, state territory in large numbers, eventually they will ask for something in return, to be political rises and that. And that is basically what happens in some of these modern history. If you, you know, if you go for conscription, those you conscript, when they come back from the war, they will ask for political rights. So, in a way, if you're the king, if you're the king, late 17th century king in Europe, you know, you can't mobilize masses for to protect your territories. And everyone knows it's the kings or you know, queens or the princes' territories. On the other hand, well, you can't raise a lot of forces. On the other hand, you know your opponents can't do the same too. Mm-hmm. So you're not living in a world where territorial conflict automatically becomes a people's war. Yeah. So it's basically king's wars usually carried out through mercenaries or quasi-mercenary bands or even mercenary armies back in the day. So what would be the incentive as a king for you? And at the time, a lot depends on in terms of wealth and prestige control of territory. So if you're a French king, you want to be the successful French king for by you know extending your territorial reach. And you know your opponents are limited like you, mm. right? They won't be able to invoke the masses for territorial defense because society does not care much about the territory beyond the territory they live. And everyone knows the territory belongs to the king or the prince or the queen. Mm. So it gives you an incentive, if you're the French king, to take every opportunity for territorial expansion. Mm. But uh, So you, you look at your neighbors, king of Spain dies, he has a sickly young son. There's instability in Spain. I mean, you start thinking to yourself, why don't I go and grab that piece of territory? Knowing that, there won't be a fierce resistance you know, from it. So you take every opportunity you have. And this leads to, in my interpretation, more frequent wars. So you have lots of wars. If you look at the period between 1648, Peace of Westphalia, up until the French Revolution, the longest peace I could track was eight years. So beyond those eight years, there's a territorial war in Europe somewhere. If your name is Louis XIV, and if you look at the number of years Louis XIV rules and fought, he spent like 54% of his years fighting with someone. So they were fighting all the time. And some of these wars could be costly, but most of them were not. Because no one was fighting people's wars over people's homelands. So this is the mosaic order. And most of the wars were caused by opportunism because, well, that guy is sick, you know, that king died, so why don't, you, why don't I make use of this brief spell and take more territory, knowing that the territorial war will not become people's war. It's going to be king's war still. Mm-hmm. Now, in the, in the presence of monolithic territoriality or age of nationalism, in such a system, now you, you might be the king, but even if you're a king, you don't own the state. You don't own the territory. Now, you are the king. You are the French king representing the French people. You are the German king, emperor representing the German people. So now you are in a representative mode. You don't own everything. So you're owning, a, you're leading a nation state, a monolithic territoriality based nation state. So in, in that sense, uh, what can you do? You can, when it's about territory, you can invoke a lot of mass you know energies for your to defend the nation right to defend the homeland mm. so it's one thing to score for a king who says i own the state on the territory to ask people to fight for that those territories it's a different thing for 
a national leader to ask the members of the nation to stand up and fight for the homeland, which is indivisible. So it becomes much easier for European states, especially European states you know, in the age of nationalism, to raise armies, fight long wars. But at the same time, if you follow the logic, it becomes also riskier to wage yeah. wars of territorial expansion. Because you know there's a good chance your opponent, you know, if he or she is smart and capable enough, may invoke these national energies, and you will be fighting with... Not with the king, you'll be fighting with the people. Mm -hmm. Your people will be fighting with the people. So under those circumstances, is my I know, argument, uh, in, in the presence of dominance of monolithic territoriality or nation-state ideal, you will have less frequent wars, so wars will be rare. But when they break out, the likelihood of such wars becoming very costly and severe will be higher. Because mm. you're no longer fighting over you know, pieces of real estate. Now, you're either fighting for your homeland or you're fighting to capture some other's homeland. Or you may, in the worst case scenario, you know, the French and the Germans, they may believe a certain piece of territory belongs to them. They, they, they may both believe in that. Mm. Then it becomes an intractable conflict. Say Alsace-Lorraine, for example, or does, is it, does it belong to Germans, does it belong to the French? It becomes a very costly, potentially you know, severe conflict is, is my argument. So in the past, in the mosaic orders, wars can be f often frequent, but on average, not always, their costs will be lower. Mm. In the age of monolithic, you know, territoriality, nationalism, wars will probably be much more rare events. But once they break out over territory, which has now become indivisible, inviolable in the age of nationalism, that war is not going to go down easily, or at least the likelihood of that war becoming very costly, severe, mm. is much higher. It's mm. staggering. Yeah, yeah, no, it's 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 nicely nicely put. I have a I have a few questions here that are all going to kind of tie together. So a few few questions I have uh, left for you. Uh, I just want to return again to the Ottoman Empire because I I find the Ottoman Empire fascinating for different reasons. Um, there was this piece in the book that I thought was really interesting, and I, I'd love to, to hear you talk about it, is you talk about why the Ottoman Empire, or you know, that the Ottoman Empire preferred an amorphous territoriality and a heterogeneous, as opposed to homogeneous, approach to social spatial organizations, which, which we kind of sort of alluded to earlier, but you could expand on that. Um, and they, you talk about these these. These kind of this, these categories of territorial expansion, right? Uh, Dar al Islam, Dar al Sol, Dar al Harb. Uh, forgive my pronunciation, but there's these interesting oh. ways in which the Ottoman Empire used uh, territorial expansion and how they viewed territoriality and how they were more heterogeneous, uh, not this homogenized way in which we kind of see things more currently. Talk about some of these mm, unique. Um, dimensions of how the Ottomans uh, were were able to 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 reign and, and to to govern their 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 territory. An excellent question. So, and thanks for asking it. The reason I use Ottoman Empire as one of the cases, well, two reasons. First, being honest, it, it was a case that I have some background on, so it was easier for me to. Make that, and I knew more about Ottoman Empire even before starting this book that compared to other cases. The second reason is, and I try to highlight that in the book, but I think it, it could be maybe further highlighted. I picked Ottoman Empire not because it was unique. I picked Ottoman Empire. It was so, it represented a general response. So if I were, if anyone wants to say, okay, you have these four different territorial models, Based on these two dimensions, we talked about mosaic orders, or, you know, early Westphalian monolithic, this, which is the nation state form, which is the last of the territorial trap. And there's virulent order, there's an amorphous order. And for amorphous orders, my first example is the Ottoman Empire. And the reason I, the second reason I picked Ottoman Empire, beyond personal reasons, is the following. Beyond these differences between like Islamic, Christian, or Western, Eastern, this and that, 
they are very typical of a traditional land empire in terms of their territorial governance. That, that is more or less how most traditional mm. land empires mm-hmm. ruled. And what makes Ottomans sort of interesting is much less studied than some other cases. But in most traditional land empires, all the way millennia back, well, this is this is why I'm asking because yep. we hear ad nauseum about the Roman Empire, we hear ad nauseum about the British Empire, we hear about all of these different empires, sure. yeah. and I feel that there are uh, the Ottomans so, I mean, have uniqueness to them in some way. I mean, they are unique in that sense, but from a territorial perspective, the reason I picked them was they're so standard. Mm-hmm. But you right, and the other reason you know I picked them is as I mentioned, they are far less known. I mean, yeah. I could I could say similar things about. You know, I, I just wrote on British Empire, but Roman Empire, other land empires, but Ottoman Empire is far less known, even though its historical importance is yeah. rather heavy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they they literally shaped the international system in ways more than in more ways than we usually recognize. Mm. So that was the main reason I picked Ottomans, because they're so first typical, but they're not that much known in the English speaking language, especially in, in the context of international relations. Literature, also in political geography, it's like they they're not usually mm. referenced or provoked, invoked. So one reason they picked amorphous territoriality is well, they were typical. Almost everyone else did that. So by the time Ottomans were picking up amorphous territoriality, if you look at Europe, if you look at other empires like China, they were also performing or pro- professing a version of it. What sort of makes Ottoman Empire interesting and relevant for today is, I mean, we can trace most of their geographical concepts to Islamic thought. So that there is a source. And you mentioned Dar al Harp, which is the land of or house of war. Uh, Dar al Islam, house of Islam. And Dar al Sukh, which is the middle gray area category. It means house of not peace, but serenity, or maybe even peace. So these categories were Darul Islam, House of Islam is where you know Muslims live and run. You know, they're ruled by a you know Muslim ruler. Darul Harp, land of war, is lands usually inhabited by Christians, ruled by Christians. Darul Sufi, land of peace, is usually places in between. I mean, they may be sort of dependents of the Islamic ruler. The societies may be mostly non-Muslim but they're still living under the rule of a Muslim ruler, at least in direct rule of a Muslim. Mm. So, and the, the versions that I use in the book are, in fact, simplified versions of some other interpretations. So some other scholars would come up with five to 10 different geographical designations. So I picked the you know easiest one, mm-hmm. still not as simple as, oh, they had the Dar al-Islam, they had the Dar al-Harp, which is a typical interpretation that people stick to in, in the Western world sometimes when they speak about these concepts. But Ottomans and many others also built on this notion of Darul Sufi, land of peace, mm. which sort of helped them mitigate this notion of, hey, you know, we're Ottoman rulers. You may or may not be non-Muslims, like say Christians in the Balkans. So, well, you know, I don't see the world in terms of black and white, land of war, land of peace. Land of Islam. There's also a third category, Land of Peace. And if you join the club, you know, it's not going to be that bad. So I'll make things sort of easier for you. I'm not going to try to impose my language on you. Mm. I will create lots of incentives for you to convert to Islam, but I will not necessarily, not always at least, try to make Muslims out of you, this and that. Mm. And in that, Ottomans did not invent these concepts. They say they borrowed them from uh, the Islamic tradition. So... Ottomans in that level is uh, more or less late era Islamic empire. So they they borrowed most of their ideas, most of the institutions from Islamic empires. But that's what I think made the one thing that made Ottomans unique is as you as you yourself highlighted, they are in, they were operating in a very very complex and intra region, you know, multi regional, multicultural platform. So they got some ideas from the Islamic thought, Islamic empires, a lot of ideas from the Persian, you know, Persian culture, Persian empires, also a lot of ideas and institutions from the Eastern Roman, Byzantium Empire. Mm-hmm. Right? So in that, I think, given what they were trying to accomplish, create, create a universal Islamic empire, to me, it was their best bet. Right? So you're trying to expand. You, don't, you can't expand if you're Ottoman Empire. You can't expand by 
fighting other conventional armies all the time. So you have to convince and co-opt the locals in the areas that you're trying to control. Mm -hmm. And you're not imposing direct control. You're not, for example, in the Balkans, you fought, you fought as the Ottoman Sultan with the leading Christian, a Serbian, this and that, you know, king, a prince. You defeat them in battle. Fine. Now, the question becomes, how will the Ottomans try to govern right. those new territories, mm -hmm. mostly Christians? Yeah. If, if they come up with a geographical idea, a geopolitical idea that says there's land of Islam, land of war. So that can be only two you know, space kinds of spaces. And then if you, if you follow with that logic, the Christians in the lands that Ottomans can control because they defeated the Christian leader, what would they do? They would probably organize around religion and try to go for a guerrilla warfare, right? Because mm -hmm. if it's only land of Islam and land of war, so if you're Christians, you're facing the risk of being converted to Islam or you are stuck in the land of war. But Ottomans came up and say, you know what? You are in the land of peace. You're in the gray area. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to convert to Islam. You don't even have to learn our language. I'll be sending, I'll be setting up some garrisons here. I'll, in fact, help you get rid of some of the aristocrats, feudal lords, you know, Christians still you don't like, and this and that. So they were trying to make sure that expansion and territorial control would be as easy and feasible as possible, mm -hmm. if it makes any sense. So there, it, was a, it was a form of conquest, gradual conquest, that aimed to first, say, convince the locals that it's okay to be, you know, indirectly ruled by the Ottoman Sultan. Second, it's okay to practice your religion, this and that. I'm not saying Ottomans were saints or angels, but mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. They, 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 yeah, and, and the reason I would say that they were they looked tolerant or seemed tolerant was not solely because they were amazing, like saint like individuals. Mm -hmm. They also had a strategic logic behind coming up with this third dimension, the gray dimension, mm. land of Peace, mm. which I think helped them expand tremendously, very fast macrohistorical standards. Something about unique about Ottomans is Ottomans do not inherit an existing empire. So Ottomans is a name referred to dynasty or a state apparatus attached to the dynasty. Their beginnings were super humble. They were one of the smallest and most in insignificant emirates in say 13th, 14th century. Northwestern Asia Minor. So they did not inherit. It. So, for example, in, in France, there's a dynasty, kicked off in a dynasty. In China, the same. In England, the same. There's Stuarts, there's Tudors. Ottomans started from near nothing, and they were able to expand very fast. And they, they emerged as one of the most powerful and large land empires in the last, say, five or six centuries and i think one reason they could do that do those things was their smart strategic you know implementation of the islamic thought i fully agree with you and this is what makes them so fascinating to me is the administrative uh organization of people groups around big amounts of land we're talking millions of kilometers is tremendous I mean, I mean, you you can't you can you can talk about all the negative things about them, sure, and, and there's plenty to say, but for 600 plus years continuously to be able to manage and to administer over large swaths of land, different ethnicities, different religions, different, I mean, that that's a that's a feat in itself. I think the maybe the early 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 precursor or kind of you know before, but uh, you know the Mongol Empire was 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 again brutal. But again, their administrative abilities and the fact that they were mostly purely nomadic and had these like, you know, <laughs> these massive moving cities is, is, is tremendous. It's tremendous as a, from an anthropological perspective, is understanding how we are as humans and how we're able to organize things. But it just makes you wonder, you know, if people could do this in the, you know, in the 12th century and the 15th century. You know, why the hell can't we do it now sometimes within yeah, I mean, one local nation state? <laughs> I mean, and, and I would say, I mean, and, I, and, I, and I would just have an answer for it. So, and I try to highlight a little bit, but not in detail. So the model that the Ottomans built was built on, well, 
indirect rule. So Ottomans rarely interfered in these distant lands directly. They're just you know collecting taxes, tributes, not messing with too much with the local arrangements. But that system relied on the absence or, or you know ignorance about the notion of territorial nationalism. Like once that once nationalism becomes a thing to mobilize masses, yeah. either for emulation or for emancipation, then this the very system Ottomans created and sustained for centuries became the Ottomans' biggest enemy. That's like there's a historical paradox there. Yeah. Because for example, the millet system is, you know, it's, it's controversial, but the version that I stick to is uh, and the version that I think is sort of accurate. Ottomans allowed uh, religious groups to organize themselves around their own principles. I mean, there will be some disadvantages if you're a non-Muslim, you won't be able to join the military or state service, right, right. this and that, unless you convert, then things are good. And, and also you have to pay higher taxes. So the Muslims would pay a certain tax, but non-Muslims would pay a far higher tax, tax this and that. And they sort of encouraged the religious groups like Catholics, Orthodox, this and that, to organize around their own religious communities. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They even allowed them to have their own legal systems. Right. So if you're a Muslim living in the Ottoman Empire, say in 17th century, you are subject to the rules or laws that apply to the Muslims. But if you're an Orthodox Christian, you are not subject to most of these laws. You are subject to your own legal, internal legal arrangements. If there's a conflict, then the state in there. So if there's if there's a Muslim in the segment with a Christian, Orthodox Christian, then the state will interfere and try to solve this. So, but, but in terms of culture, and there, there is not much of an emphasis on trying to impose the religion, uh, not only the religion, but also language. So imagine this, you're, you're, you're born, you're, you grew up in Serbia and say in 19th century, and your family has you grew up in Serbia for since like forever. And you're you're part of you're a subject of the Ottoman Empire. But in your everyday life, you have been living around the church and all these cultural communities and this and that. So you're building your life around those you know, co- sense of community. And out of the blue, this thing called nationalism comes along. It becomes a tool for, you know. Emulation and emancipation. And at that point in time, when nationalism hits the Ottoman Empire, the Ottomans understand that they gave those other ethnic groups or religious groups everything they needed for centuries mm. to organize and rise up against Ottomans, mm. if it makes any sense. So they mm-hmm. gave them all the tools mm. yeah. to do their own thing. Mm. Live their own lives, keep their culture, keep their language, organize around that culture or, or that religion. And it served them well for a long time. When the nation state ideal from a territorial you know, perspective comes along, a you know, house of cards simply just fell mm-hmm. apart. And the reason they fell apart was partially the reason is Ottomans set those you know, house of cards. Mm. Mm. Yeah, it's it's, so, it's it's almost like a combusting from inside of sorts. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so it, yeah. Ottoman Empire to a large extent imploded, and in fact, Ottomans get a really bad rap in the Balkans, also in the Middle East, in the you know, former Ottoman territories, like you know, anywhere in the Middle East. There's there's some there might be some sympathy, not so much in the Balkans, but in the Middle East mm-hmm. towards the Ottoman Empire, but not as much as you would imagine. So, and the reason is the following. So if you're the Ottoman ruler, say by mid to late 19th century, you understand there's this thing called centralization of government, rise of nationalism, territorial singularity, this and that. And now you're feeling after centuries, the brunt of your sort of inefficiencies in the face of European armies. European armies, Russian army, they just you know, slapping you left and right. Mm. And if you're Ottoman Sultan, what do you try to do? You are like, okay, let's go for emulation. The Ottomans try to emulate Western states in terms of centralization of governments, this and that. As they try to centralize, because they were ruling through decentralized methods, as they try to centralize governance, they they end up stirring up these like people in the Balkans, folks in the Middle East, further. So once we look back, 
If you look back in 17th, 18th century, yeah, Ottomans were doing sort of okay, but Ottomans, especially in the late 19th century, early 20th century, just to, just to improve themselves by emulating the West in terms of centralization of governance, they you know, they put further fuel on the fires. Mm. So once you know, once we talk about how Syrians, how Iraqis might have seen Ottoman empires, those memories are not always great because those memories in their nation state formation years also was formed around anti-Ottoman sentiments. Mm. So the, if you want to, if you are the leader of Iraq, if you are the leader of Syria, say seven, eight years ago. You have to create a notion of unique national territorial identity. Mm. You can't do that by saying Ottomans were amazing. Then, yeah. you know, and you, you can do that by, by creating Ottomans as the enemy. And doing that, you will have lots of actual evidence to show that. You, all you have to do is show what the Ottomans tried to do to Arab-speaking populations or the Balkans, this and that, throughout the course of late 19th century, early 20th century. And then the Ottomans did try to do opposite of what they did for head down for like mm -hmm. centuries. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's like a, which is why I think the national state model is like a cash 22. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So even if you don't like it, you end up finding yourself <laughs> repeating the same cycle. Okay. And it's, right. it's a model that has so, sort of shaped good or bad, our understanding of how the world works in the last at least hundred years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the last big question I want to ask you, um, is a bunch of different things, but in the book you talk about, we don't have to talk about it now, but maybe you can maybe re make reference to it, but you talk about these kind of four big wars, you know, the 30 years war, which you've already mentioned revolutionary Napoleonic wars, and then obviously world war one, world war two, how the question I want to ask though, really, if you want to set some of that up is, is fine, but how do different territorial ideas affect how states and societies approach organized violence and they transform some of these territorial ideas. So, you know, you've talked about the territorial trap and, and, and how are some ways to kind of avoid that? So maybe uh, if it fits here, you can tell me if it doesn't, but maybe if it fits here, maybe you can give us as a case example, the current Russian Ukraine uh, conflict war, Obviously, uh, Putin has made some remarks and interviews more recently and has talked about his uh, very selective history on Russia and Ukraine. And, and, um, and so there's a whole lot of things here. So maybe uh, just kind of the last big piece here, you can leave listeners with this idea of how do we, how do, we, how do state societies approach this kind of way of, of looking at territorial order and ideas and, and um, and then the use of, of conflict there, and, and maybe using the, the example of Russia, Ukraine at the moment um, to, to kind of illustrate that. Oh, great question. So, you know, I'll start with the first big issue about why these four wars, which is like 30 years war, French revolutionary, Napoleonic wars, World War One, World War Two. One main reason is uh, in the end, I'm an international relations scholars and those wars have been seen as systemic wars, being global wars that change the world. I could have picked some other wars too, but I wanted to pick most common four wars mm. that international relations scholars refer to as systemic wars with global influence. Sure. What I tried to do was show the territorial perspective or show the territorial effects of these wars on how we think about territory. And long story short, in my argument, 30 years war sort of set to path for mosaic territoriality early Westphalian. The French Revolutionary and Napoleonic Wars make mosaic territoriality possible, but they do something paradoxical. They make monolithic orders built on nationalism you now much more dominant. What does World War I do and what, what does World War II do? I separate the impacts of World War I and World War II in two dimensions, the West and the rest. Mm. In the West, World War I sort of uh, is the final nail on the coffin for the nation state ideal. Af you know, after mm. World War I, in the Western world, nation state form is the golden one. Mm. World War II further establishes that, changes some borders, this and that. In the non Western world, World War I you know, puts the promise of self determination on the table with Wilson and his principles. But in the Paris Peace Conference after the war in 1919, 
anyone who's not from Europe is denied. So if mm-hmm. you are like coming from Vietnam uh, or just the Middle East, this and that, Asia, and you're thinking that maybe the self-determination principle will apply to you, and but you're shunned. The European powers are like, oh, we're not going to do that. So you, you will be living in colonies. But World War I, by setting up the nation state form as a territorial gold standard, mm. convinces a lot of political entrepreneurs in the colonized world to shoot for their own independence. And they understand the only way they can do this is by claiming and by being nation states like the European nation states. Mm. And after World War II, for a number of reasons, colonialism is on a death path. And so that in the book that I, I made the case that World War II sort of set the stage for colonial territorial arrangements to go down the tubes, and all of them, almost all of them, not all of them, but most of them will be replaced by nation states mm. format. So mm. in the last part of the book, I talk about not only how different territorial ideas affect war, but how war them, wars themselves mm. affect territorial ideas. And the reason I put another reason I put all these systemic wars is the, their impacts are easier to show. So the mm. bigger the war, the, mm. you know, the more global the war, it's easier to show the impacts it might have on dominant territorial ideas. So on that account, when it comes to Russo-Ukrainian war, and we just talked about this before we actually kicked off the podcast, mm-hmm. and I was hoping that you'd ask this. So mm-hmm. in the book, and then again, it was the original submission to Oxford University Press did not have the first chapter, did not have any section on the Russo-Ukrainian war, but I submitted, I submitted the final version. I got the final approval. By the time I got the final approval, the war began. So, yeah. and, and the reviewers are like, you know, hey, maybe you want to talk about this. So I think I spent about a good amount of time to just apply the insights of the book to the Russo-Ukrainian war. So the book was written after before the Ukrainian war, but the finalization of the book came after the war broke out. Mm. And in a way, uh, in the book overall, I highlight the influence of territorial ideas Mm. and on war and how wars may affect territorial ideas. In that sense, and the book was completed like a year and a half ago. So it's Mm. what's in the book is not up to date, but especially given the recent interview with Putin there's, there's sort of, I feel they're sort of relevant because in the book I make the case that if you look at the territorial ideas, especially in the post-Cold War Russia, before Putin, but also including Putin, mm. Putin is trying to invoke a more or less an imperial or imperialistic or neo-imperialistic territorial set of ideas. And mm. uh, this this set of ideas and the in the Russian world, Putin, in fact, established the Royal Russian Society. So I'm not making this up. There's an idea about, there's an idea called the Russian world, Ruski Amir, I'm probably mispronouncing. So there's actually a center built on that concept. And the concept is very straightforward. You know, it's what I would refer to as a geopolitical vision. It's about how Putin wants the world and the Russians to think about Russia's place as a geographical unit in the past, in the present, and into the future. But the past and the present in, in his line of thinking are intertwined. For Putin, and that's what I just pinned down on the paper, in, in, the, in the book, not in the paper, uh, the idea is that Ukraine, as a territorial unit, has never been sovereign, has never been a real nation state. Mm. There's never been a real nation. And if you look at the Ukrainian history a little bit, Ukraine has been a rather big victim as a territorial unit and as a society for centuries. It was mostly under the influence of the Russian Empire, but it was also affected by, say, whoever's running the show in the West, mostly Austrian Empire and very much the Germany. Mm. It was seen more or less like a buffer zone. And even the current present-day Ukrainian borders were not established fully until the, until after the end of World War II. Mm. So even the even some of the Ukrainian borders were drawn by the Soviet leadership to a large extent. So the Putin's argument is, well, we are the full grown Russians and Ukrainians are little Russians. Mm. And and he all, always goes back in history and talk gives his, gives us an interpretation of history. If you follow this historical you know, narrative, what you end up with is the following. There's no such place as Ukraine 
Ukraine was in fact a part of Russia, and Ukrainians are not really Ukrainians. They are not you know, unique. They are simply little Russians and some maybe traitors, some, some unwanted folks. So, you know, now Ukraine, which should be our underling, our imperial, you know, dependency, is trying to turn to the West. And from that perspective, in the argument, in the book, I make the argument that to a large extent, Putin's or the set of ideas that Putin you know, champions play a role in how Russia has approached Ukraine, especially in the last couple of years. But over and over again, Putin highlights that Ukraine is not a real sovereign entity. Mm-hmm. Right? You get the sense that from his you know, talks, from how Russia behaves recently, especially, that Putin does not want the world and the Russians, or also Ukrainians, to think that they're on par. They're not the same nation state, nation state. There's a Russian former empire, the you know, chief of the communist revolution, this and that. Uh, and there's the Ukrainians. They are simply sitting on Russian territory, and some of them are confused little Russians. Some of them don't even deserve to inhabit those territories. Mm-hmm. And once I heard the parts of the yesterday's interview with Putin, <laughs> in so many ways, especially for those who have been following Putin's, you know, writing speeches and that, there was nothing new. I think what's What's new was the following. Mostly American audiences do not hear, get to hear what Putin's narrative, rhetoric in large detail. Now, more people were hearing what some of us have been looking into for a couple of years, more, more than a couple of years, what Putin has actually been saying. So from that perspective, it's sort of sad why that Putin thinks of Ukraine that way, and he admits it. And he, in fact, provides a narrative about it. But at the same time, from my end, uh, I, I'm not embarrassed today for what I wrote, say, more than a year ago. So in that sense, uh, this is about how territorial ideas may affect war. So you, I would argue that Putin's set of ideas, the ideas that he's trying to promote, play the role in Russian incursions into Ukraine. Not only now, also in 2014 and onwards. Mm-hmm, right? mm-hmm. So the conflict didn't start like a couple of years ago. It's, it's been ongoing for a decade. So the impacts of wars on territorial ideas, again, the, the jury is still out there, but in the end, Russo-Ukrainian war will change uh, how Ukrainians think about their national territory, even how Russia Russians think their own territory. My guess is if the war ends with a territorial redistribution, Ukraine may end up losing some territory. Uh, Putin will Step on, will step on the brakes and will give up his imperial discourse and will say, we were fighting for national Russian territories. We got what we wanted. We're good. And even after they lose territories, I think the war will have a significant impact on Ukrainian nationalism. Hmm. So it may have, it, it will have a lot of negative impacts on Ukraine, you know, demograf- demographics, economy, this and that. But it will also paradoxically you know, embolden territorial nationalism in Ukraine. Mm. Just like it was for Alsace-Lorraine, for the French when they lost to the Germans. Mm. Even after you lose some chunks of territory, maybe after you lose some chunks of territory, for the remain remaining society, the sense of territorial belongingness may go up. Mm. And that is what I'm thinking. That's, that's for the Russia and Ukraine. But wars like this, which were thought to be unimaginable until a couple of years ago, yeah. right? A major land war in the heart of Europe that has never that has not happened since 1945. Right. Not on the scale, not, not by a long shot. Conventional war. That war is also going to change how we think about the territory, globally speaking, right? Mm. So if Rus- Russia and Ukraine can go to war in the heart of Europe, Almost seven of seven and five years, seventy years after, or well, in fact, eighty years after World War II ended, and then it's time for us maybe to rethink how we think about territory, right? Because up until 10, 20, it's 10, 20 years ago, a lot of international relations scholars and spectators, like you know, commentators, would say, "Oh, the territorial order is over, right? Territorial world is done. It's about a network. It's about no borders." But right now, we're seeing more and more how territory 
is still important. And I would say territory has not made a comeback. Terri- the importance of territory has always been with us. Mm. And the Russo-Japanese war is showing us that even in the heart of Europe, the risk of a war of territorial conquest is not zero, far from it. And finally, there's this norm that in international relations literature we refer to as territorial integrity norm. That's the idea that was sort of established by the UN and forced by leading great powers, that no state should take territory from another state through use of arms. Mm. And there are not that many cases. I mean, there's a case of, that we can always find cases, the closest call would be North Korea, South Korea in 50, 53, and a more recent one, Saddam Hussein in 1990, 1991 over Kuwait. But Saddam Hussein and North Korea were sort of, I wouldn't say punished, but Saddam was punished. But things were put back to normal. And a lot of people you know, thought, also in my community, maybe this thing called territorial integrity norm finally got stuck. Mm. So wars of territorial conquest is a thing of the past that we may even forget about it. It may happen in other undeveloped parts of the world, but not in Europe. So right now we're seeing for the last couple of years a really bloody, really costly land war in the heart of Europe. So that will change how we and how other actors across the globe will think about territory. Yeah, absolutely. I guess uh, the last question kind of similar to that is, is, you know, how do we, things are changing of sorts all the time. There's conflict everywhere still. How do we have improved ideas about states, boundaries, territories? You know, we're having a, <clears throat> a world in a future where we're connected digitally and, and, and the internet and obviously globalization has pros and cons to that. And, and so we're more connected than ever. And, um, and migration is, uh, is another big piece. And there, there's a lot of uh, people that are um, getting together and coexisting and, you know, in different spaces. And so how, how do you think in, you know, 25 or 50 years or whatever, how do we, where's, where is our kind of, uh, where, what are the trend lines telling you of how we continue to think about territories and states and, and boundaries? Excellent question. So I think it's a good way to you know, end mm-hmm. the conversation too. And from a normative perspective, I try to not make big comments or big claims because that's not how I think about territory. And I would be the last person to say, oh, you know what? To fix the world, we should do this and that. And Because I know that's not how the world works. It's not like, you know, we have this cause. If everyone follows it from a territorial perspective, it will fix things. Uh, so I don't have a normative you know, claim or just a path forward. One thing at the short term I can say is it will be healthier to try to match the territorial ideas or the aspiration, aspirational ideas with the facts on the ground. So if you have a massive gap between how, we, how many people think about that sp- Say, for example, state A, oh, it's a robust nation state, while in reality that case A, country A, is not a robust nation state. Maybe it's time to say, okay, maybe let's not impose or try to impose further social spatial homogeneity. Let's not try to make everyone similar. Maybe try to come up with territorial arrangements that will fit the facts on the ground more so than the aspirational model that nation state model is. Mm -hmm. But beyond that, why, why do I see territorial ideas and institutions and arrangements, say 10, 25, say 50, I think, 25, 50 is easier to claim because, well, I'm not going to be held responsible for it as opposed to next year. So staying true to my book, the ideas in my book, I think I, can't see a, I cannot see a way that... We will stay in this territorial trap, the nation's you know, obsession with the nation state ideal some 25, 50 years down the road. But I also don't think that these ideas will change gradually and all by themselves. Mm. So in my observation of 
past, say, about a thousand years in terms of the territorial evolution or evolution of the territorial arrangements, I think the biggest shaker and movers are stuff like wars. Mm. So a major war, which may happen, maybe not. World War Three, maybe another, you know, not world war, but a major war, a major disaster, maybe another and far deadlier virus, mm. a pandemic, something of an exogenous shock will eventually tilt the balance. So the way I see it, and here's what I'm trying to say, really, the nation state model is so robust. It's decaying in many parts of the world. So the, the gap between the facts and the aspiration is widening. But in my reading, the transition is not going to be all by itself. It's not going to be like one day people will wake and say, oh my God, you know, why do we think these you know, ideas about territory, the nation state, let's do something to change it. There'll be a lot of activists, a lot of you know, folks who are trying to make that change, but I don't see that happening all by itself, gradual shift towards something different. But from my reading, once you have something like 30 years war, some, once you have something like World War I, World War II, and it doesn't have to be a war, it can be a disaster, natural disaster, another pandemic. So the change is inbuilt into the system, but the change to me will not happen all by itself. Once we have a catalyst, and I think it's safe to assume that there might be an unforeseen or not easy to see catalyst in the next 25, 50 years, could be environmental, could be anything, could be pandemic, could be something technological, could be anything. When that happens, I think we will see the real shift. Mm, mm, yeah. And if I have to guess anything, it's not, the tilt is not going to be going towards homogenization of society. Mm, it's going to mm -hmm. be more like heterogenization. But again, let's talk in 25, 50 years. <laughs> yeah, exactly, right? <laughs> uh, well, I think that's, that's, all, that's all great. It's all really good things to think about. And I think I kind of, it's a good, uh, things that you have in the book and things you had in, in that you've talked about here is, so it gives it a really nice kind of uh, rubric uh, to kind of sort of think about things in terms of when people read the news or when they hear things about, you know, certain types of conflicts or territorial uh, kinds of issues. Uh, Barack, this was this was uh, this was so much Pleasure. fun. I, I really I really really enjoyed uh, having you on and, and and talking about all the wonderful things in your book and, and hearing hearing you say everything that you said. So it's a it's been a it's been an absolute blast. And I, uh, I most uh, certainly would want to have you on again to talk about the one you're working on now. That sounds absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much for the invitation again. And it's, it's been my pleasure. Hopefully in about a year or so, maybe maybe a maximum <laughs> two years, we can do it again. And Dan, I'll be your person to talk endlessly about Turkey. <laughs> fantastic. I look forward to it. Thank you.